The episode you're about to watch is taken from the Talking Health Tech Autumn Summit, a virtual event that we held a few weeks ago, and we host these every quarter, exclusive for our THT Plus members and some guests as well, and they're usually a full-day event covering a range of topics, collaborative panel sessions that translate well to podcast episodes. So if you're listening on your favorite podcast player, you'll get a lot out of this one. Also, if you're watching on YouTube or our website, you can see what all the action's about as well. So if you do want to catch future summits live, like I said, we hold them every quarter for our THT Plus members. Learn more about joining THT Plus, which is our membership offering for anyone interested in learning and connecting about technology and healthcare. Go to talkinghealthtech.com slash THT Plus because our winter summit will be in August and it's already shaping up to be a really good one. But as a special treat, Here's a session taken from our Talking Health Tech Autumn Summit. Special thanks to Informatics, who are gold sponsors for our Talking Health Tech Autumn Summit. They've been great supporters of all the summits that we've done and just generally things we do at Talking Health Tech. You're really going to enjoy this one. Here we go. This is Talking Health Tech with me, Peter Birch, featuring content and community about technology in healthcare. Let's delve into the critical role of digital technology standards and multidisciplinary teams in healthcare from the perspective of the task force and clinicians. Let's explore innovative collaborations that enhance healthcare accessibility and quality for all Australians. And let's add some muscle to Medicare. This is session eight of the Talking Health Tech Autumn Summit titled Medicare for the 21st Century. I'll be moderating this discussion with Dr. Steve Hambleton, Chief Clinical Advisor for the Australian Digital Health Agency. And Dr. Talat Upal, Director at Women's Health Road. We've got some excitement in the chat about uh, about this topic coming up. We can see Paul. I know. I know he he likes this kind of stuff too, uh, and uh, I, so it's great to have Dr. Talat Apple and Dr. Steve Hambleton here with us. Hey, team. Good to be with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look, Talat, it's great to see the the genuine nature that you bring to this conversation. <laughs> Literally, you the off the back of the the operating theatre. Did you want to come off off mute and maybe just to give us a bit more of a, the a, call a context of yourself and what you do and uh, in this conversation? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Pete, on this amazing um, forum that um, we need so many initiatives like this that um, raise awareness and and um, about digital health. Um, so I'm an obstetrician and a gynecologist. So I'm a mere clinician. I work in the northern beaches of Sydney and I have a passion in addition to the clinical role for education and management. And I think that the bedrock of any sort of model of care that you're planning um, has to be efficient and solid digital technology. And that was how I got drawn to how can we do things better when we are providing care to the community that we serve. And so although I work mostly in the private system now, I have been um, a staff specialist and a clinical director of a public um, maternity unit in the past, and I still provide mixed care for public and private patients. And I think the two factors that bring us, um, that we are, we're constantly trying to find solutions for are the fragmentation of healthcare when it comes to um, state and federal um, level of funding and um, models, and also how to try and streamline the care through the patient's lens. And, to, and that was what I was hoping that we would have some discussion about, but over to you. Mm. You know, thank you. And it'll be great to get uh, a bit of uh, context to about, about Steve. Did you want to um, tell us a bit more about yourself and the work you do? Well, look, um, thank you very much and really pleased to be here. It's um, This has been a huge journey for me uh, over a number of years. And I guess I'm standing on the shoulders of lots of others who've um, got us to this point. But um, I guess my, my uh, I'm a GP. I'm a GP in Brisbane. Um, Right back in 2009, I was elected vice president of the AMA and uh, followed by being president of the AMA. Uh, and so I guess you get involved in health, health reform, um, health systems um, at a national level, and it gives you a bird's eye view of what's going on. At that point in time, if everyone remembers, the, um, uh, the, the PCHR, Personally Controlled Electronic Health Record, was launched. Um, it was uh, a different government, same, same colour government as today. And um, governments in 
uh, in, in, well, all governments have realised that if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to get the same outcomes and uh, we're spending more in our public hospitals, we've got a disconnected health system. And we had the start of the journey with NITA and the PCHR. Um, uh, I was asked uh, uh, to do a review of the PCHR when the new government came in, and that was the Royal Review. So I was, I was fortunate to be on the Royal Review to make some recommendations about the future. And uh, in fact, following my departure from the AMA, I became the chairman of, of NITA, and it was uh, our job to deliver on the recommendations of the review, which is what le has led to the Australian Digital Health Agency being formed. Um, but in the meantime, um, I was very, very fortunate uh, to, to be uh, co-chair uh, co of uh, or deputy chair of the Medicare Benefit Schedule Review, 5,700 item numbers. Really, that's the system that's been in place for 35 years. Uh, at the same time, I was the chairman of the Primary Healthcare Advisory uh, Group, which looked at healthcare homes, a different model of care, different funding model to underpin that model of care. And I was also on the Implementation Advisory Group. And having done all that, uh, I also ended up on the strengthening uh, on the um, primary healthcare reform steering group with uh, my colleague Wally Jamal as co-chair. Um, and uh, you know, when you so, in other words, involved in a lot of health reform. Um, and look, very unusually and very pleasingly, and uh, it was absolute privilege when the government changed. Um, the minister's view, this minister, our current minister's view was very similar to the previous minister. If we don't do something different, we're going to get the same outcome. It's really unacceptable. First ministers all around the country are saying the same thing, and you saw them stand up and say, we need to have better primary care and better connected health care. And the minister, this minister, set up the, the um, Strengthening Medicare Task Force, and I was on that task force. So I've been absolutely pri privileged to be on so many of these health reform bodies at the same time I'm the Chief Clinical Advisor for the Australian Digital Health Agency. I'm on the board of the Digital Health Cooperative Research Centre. So I've got my finger on the pulse in, in quite a few different places. It's been an absolutely amazing journey. And I can tell you that um, this budget has really seized the opportunity. And it's not, we're not finished that journey. It's the start. And the Minister actually said that, you know, this it's going to be a multi-budget journey, uh, but they have done a, a huge amount of work to start that journey. Mm -hmm. um, the college and the AMA, of which I was uh, part of, have all said, you've got to help us today. You know, general practice, primary care is in real trouble. The budget's delivered a huge in investment, but it's also laid the foundations uh, for, a, for a different a mixed and blended funding model. Um, and also, uh, well, put a stake in the sand and said, we are going digital. We are going to fund the Digital Health Agency uh, as an ongoing body. It's the first government that's actually said that, uh, which basically means we are serious uh, and our, uh, our, our, the people we work with, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the industry now is saying, well, it's here to stay. We need to engage. Uh, we need to deliver one health system connected by data. We need to make sure that clinicians and, and consumers are informed at the point of care so we can make the best decisions. Um, really, really, really good opportunity. Um, what better place to be but in digital health? So um, let's, let's, let's get on that uh, bus. It's left the station. Yeah. Make sure we get to the destination. Look, Steve, that... I, there's the, the level of excitement about that is is uh, like it's kind of like well what do we what do we do with that because it's because you think and you've you've seen it much more than than I and I can see Bernie um, you know in the chat too and many others been around for like been know that the potential that exists here but like you say that you know the the, the it looks like the the government and the budget is, is seizing this opportunity and I encourage attendees to seize this opportunity given that we've got Steve here live to put those questions and comments in the chat because we can really start to unpack this as an interesting conversation but I think it's what I love too is in this conversation now we've got you to lot here you know very much you said at the start too you bring that um you know make sure that everything we're doing here around reform or whether it's teams it's all for the patient side i know that's important to you steve too but you know for to like literally just come off the back mm -hmm. of you know doing doing surgery and that's mm -hmm. um very much your thing talk to me a bit more about that um you know these things that we're doing around building teams and and mm -hmm. ensuring the funding is there from a patient side why do you mm -hmm. raise that as such important thing? 
Thanks, Peter. So basically, Peter, I have set up a model of multidisciplinary care for women. And as a generalist gynecologist, I've always had a passion for community care and for um, hand, had a strategic role with GP education. So when I was setting up my model, I felt, look, there is no MDT that is complete without the lens of a general practitioner specialist. Um, of course, we value very much our nursing colleagues, our allied health, our physiotherapists, pharmacists. Everyone has something so, so critical to bring to the journey. And I think that having worked at the core face in an MDT, I I can't speak, um, you know, I couldn't, I, I think that that era of us working alone in one room, seeing 40 patients all by ourselves is very much over. The future of health is collaboration, but it has not come without its pain points. And one of the main issues that I faced when I was setting up this model was the electronic medical record or the practice software, because Honestly, I felt so many times like I was trying to make a Rubik's Cube and then I would almost get it right and then I'd be like, there's some missing pieces in this Rubik's Cube, you know, <laughs> because at the end of the day, I'm still not getting um, all of the, the Santa's wish list ticked. And they're excellent models. If you want to remain in GP practice, they're servicing, you know, people are possibly a bit less interested in cloud systems. And so they seem to work reasonably well. And there are also other options for non-GP specialists that seem to tick our boxes in terms of billing and in terms of all the other bits that we are hoping would um, be available. But I'm still struggling to find something that would meet all of our needs. And that has been one of my issues where they and I'm really, really happy to see the amazing enthusiasm from software companies to actually look at what the clinicians who actually deliver MDT care, what our problems are. And <clears throat> because we also were hoping for some sort of a patient portal or a patient engagement tool. Again, I keep coming back to that because I think unless in Australia we start th thinking through the lens of the community we serve, we will continue to compartmentalize our care. And because we still have that philosophy of, okay, now she's being discharged from hospital, she's somebody else's headache. Not that it's deliberate. Clinicians are very, very well-intentioned. But there's only a finite health dollar and everyone is under that strain that, you know, the, the resources are quite stretched. So there is that culture that, you know, we keep constantly keep compartmentalizing women or the patients that we care for. Um, so one reflection was that I think we need standards for interoperability, but also standards about practice software being available and some things being, you know, requirements to say, look, does it actually meet the needs of GPs? Our GP morale is at an all-time low. And so it is. I was so happy to see the federal um, budget to give you know some oomph and some recognition to our um, various primary care providers. Um, and I think that that is so important to get behind that and say, look, it's very well to say set up MDTs and we're quarantining this much money, and it's excellent. But at the end of the day, the clinician at the core phase needs to be able to interact electronically um, or digitally with all of our colleagues. Otherwise, literally, the corridor consult then becomes more superior than reading the notes electronically and having all that information or the advantage. Because in a practical sense, I can tell you that we share our electronic records and it brings such a strength to the model. And I have worked in a previous system where I didn't have that luxury. And I used to be like, oh, I wonder what the physio thought. And then, you know, it was not even longitudinal care. But now I can actually read that before i pick the patient to invite into the room for a follow-up visit. And it gives me the understanding of someone else who is such so talented in that field, adding on to this woman's journey. So that's my first point in terms of looking at um, softwares and how can we actually physically make that available for practices like ourselves who choose to innovate. Many times I sit and I think, oh, that's why none of my colleagues do this. It's because it's actually really tricky to coordinate in a practical sense. And the other thing that I reflected on is I'm probably, and I'm happy to be corrected, I'm probably the only ONG specialist in the country that has chosen to have their practice accredited by RACGP because for me it's not only a passion to serve um, to include primary care in the care that we provide but it's actually important to me to understand 
very well. And that's why I think now we, because we look after, we have an amazing GP specialist in our team, then we have secondary care. We also have, um, obviously, we care for women in the hospital or uh, patients in the hospital. Um, what that brings is that that whole journey of how does the patient start care in the home navigate all our various points that they have to and then return home. So I think that patient journey really has to be the focus rather than what is the part that I'm funded for and therefore I'm only going to do this part and try and connect in, in whichever way that I can with all the other bits and pieces. Um, th those have been some of my reflections. And the third thing we spoke about standards. So I was privileged enough to be able to get really high-end equipment for our, our practice. And at the end of the day, we spent so much money and I would have, for example, if I give an example of, let's say, a coposcopy machine, okay, it arrived from Germany, $45,000, which for me as a small business is a big amount. And basically, you know, I have to write on a, on a piece of paper, this is Jane Smith's cervix, take a picture. And that's the first picture. So we have these amazing patient engagement tool. We can show her the cervix. It does go via secure message into, uh, not into the patient journey, but into a central file. Okay. But why couldn't this have been legislated? I would have happily paid another few thousand dollars as a clinician to have had that feature integrated. And I think that we have to now say to equipment that it that that's just the way it is digital is the future of health in australia and you have to make these capabilities easier for clinicians to who want not to keep having all these pain points i could sorry not, to be I, no, <laughs> I, I mean the support in the chat is is all there and and i can <laughs> uh, i can expect many others would resonate with you there. and and i love that you know i think you said at some point there that it's important to focus on what's good for the patient as opposed to you know what's going to be funded and that and that and I love that but there are so many you know I'm going to go to Steve for, for this one you know there's so many clinicians and, and businesses that need to be run because in the end you know to provide the, the the care that the business still needs to be run and we know in healthcare often something doesn't get done unless someone gets paid for it so there's a lot of complexity there Steve how do we find this balance between building teams around patients to do these amazing things but also you know bring the funding oh look that is that has been the big challenge um, and that that has been a huge um, learning curve i suppose for how to implement what what is really a good ideas um you know we're re we're redesigning the plane while it's flying and um you know the point we made to the minister during the strengthening medicare task force is actually we're redesigning the plane while it's crashing we kind of need to stop it from crashing. We need to start to level out and we need to take off again. Um, and the observation we made in the primary healthcare advisory group rolling back a couple of, you know, good ideas ago, and we recommended, you know, healthcare homes and uh, a, a team care and a different funding model. Um, the model of care is not the problem. In fact, implementation of the way that we went about that was where it, uh, where it stumbled. Um, so we need to think about the way we implement, even the strengthening uh, Medicare task force. We made the point to the minister um, that this needs to be, uh, uh, we, just, we need support for practice managers, for change merchants, for, for clinical leadership to, to help with change over time. But you made a very, very important point, and that is the way we fund care. Um, and look, Medicare, uh, and we need to strengthen Medicare. Medicare was designed, you know, 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago, where the problems were different. In, in most cases, it was an infectious disease. It was a single visit. A single person could manage it. Uh, Fee-for-service in that setting is wonderful uh, for specialist services. And in fact, interestingly, obstetrics has always been a team sport. But for, for a lot of surgical specialties, please take the appendix out. Please send the patient back. Very simple, very straightforward. Fee for service, great idea. But now that we've got uh, multiple comorbidities in most patients, and the the problems we're seeing are chronic and complex, you know that um, face to face, real time, fee for service payment is in conflict with the model of care, and that's the point we made with the chronic uh, disease advisory group. We need complementary funding systems. So that the natural outcome of the funding is the model of care. We can't have the model of care competing with the model for funding. And yet, uh, you make the point, and we need to keep businesses alive in the meantime. 
Uh, so the tripling of the bulk billing incentive, you might say, is a way of keeping general practice alive. A voluntary patient registration with additional payments, particularly focused on people with chronic disease, um, is a way of introducing a new funding model gradually and you know, testing that process and drawing uh, the acute sector back into uh, the primary care sector through PHNs so that we have one health system visible to the patient. Um, the language from the minister that said sharing by default, um, why wouldn't we be sharing by default? Why haven't we been sharing by default? Um, there is so much waste in the system and uh, when I look at when I look at the patient in front of me and I wonder uh, what the results that the specialist requested were for that patient. When the specialist, when Dr. Apple sees a patient of mine and says, I wonder what Steve requested. I'd love to know what that blood count was last week. I'd love to know, um, you know, the, the uh, antenatal tests that were done. Uh, you know, I didn't get a copy directly, but I'd love to be able to have my software presented to me in the, uh, at the right time in my consultation so I don't have to repeat the tests. Mm. Um, you know, we need to, we need to, all of the things need to come together. But the funding model is critical. Uh, and, you know, as I say, the, the natural outcome of the frameworks that we work in needs to push us together as teams, needs to feel like it's one health system, uh, not primary care, acute care, secondary care, you know, not connected. Um, a very interesting uh, observation in the chat earlier. Uh, you know, I was chairman of NITA, and NITA's job was, individual identifiers, doctor identifiers, location identifiers, which, which coding system are we going to use, you know, SNOMED CT, uh, which coding system for medications are we going to use, AMT, which is a subset of SNOMED. Uh, why aren't we using all of those things? Why aren't individual health identifiers universal? Why aren't they? should be. Uh, you know, NITA was, a, was, was all of the health leadership around the country getting in a room saying, yes, we think this is right for Australia. Um, but that that overarching push by government to say it's now time, you know, it's, it's not just health ministers in the states. It's actually it's actually state premiers going. We need we need to collaborate. Uh, we need to be interoperable. We need to have a common language. And um, if you don't use the language, you need to map to the language. Um, and Dr. Apple's quite right. You know, we need, we should be able to buy anything inside these parameters. Not outside the parameters. You need to buy stuff that's interoperable. You need to buy stuff that talks to our current systems. Otherwise, you shouldn't be able to buy it. Um, same goes for state governments. And, uh, you know, we need to think about how we, how we connect together by default. We need to use those PHNs and the data that we create uh, as a byproduct of what we do to actually automatically draw us together. So there's, there's, there's huge opportunity. The problems that we're facing are different. We do need to work in teams. We need funding models that support those teams. And we need to be naturally drawn together, not naturally separated. Uh, so, look, it's not going to be an easy journey, but we've definitely started. Absolutely. I'm looking at the, the, the comments coming through on the chat there too. Uh, but coming back to, you know, Talat for a second mm -hmm. about how, you know, you raised um this this importance of of i'm sure you did about co-design and, and working mm -hmm. with those those vendors to to create some of these solutions I, I can see there there is a good representation in the chat of like well okay we're sensing this buzz about like there's there's this excitement this movement towards the piece i want to come to change and implementation in a second too because steve you pointed that out as a really important point but mm -hmm. In terms of working with the vendors and the clinicians and and all of that, like, is there advice or things that you can you can say? Well, this is where these vendors should be putting that um, attention and, and energy and excitement towards you know actually building some things that that points in the right direction and keep this momentum going. Uh, any advice you can share there from your side? Look, I think it is about embracing MDT in its true true form um, beyond just the four walls of the geography of the cottage or the hospital or wherever you might be based in the community. Um, I feel that, you know, that there has to be, and, and I'm actually, it, it is palpable. I think that there is a desire for change and, and the budget actually giving some, um, I shouldn't call it coins, but um, <laughs> towards this, I think has also lifted some momentum or some enthusiasm about this, but definitely not only practice software, but also um, 
all the like th there's so many tools it's not for want of the tools we have wonderful um virtual care options i think the other thing that we really need to consider is cost of everything so one practical problem again i'm sharing things from a clinician call face point of view is that if you're practicing mdt many of the people in our team or in our um, clinical cohort are actually tenanted um, doctors so there is that anxiety around payroll tax as well that these are people who are true contractors it's a hub and spoke model mm. but is someone now going to say because we're trying to share things to do the best safe thing for the patient and also try to create a cohesive team and move with the times that is someone now going to feel that they are employees and not you know from a from a tax perspective and so i think that all of these things need clarity because Doctors are not necessarily all that, I'm not speaking for everybody, but many doctors are not that gifted at finance or or even at digital, to be honest. So I think that it would be helpful if we had more clarity around these barriers, because it's it's great that, you know, um, our prime minister has spoken and our health minister has spoken about MDT care. But in a practical sense, when you're going to implement it, these are the things that are going to go through your mind that, you know, how do I make that Rubik's Cube so that there aren't any missing pieces? Yeah. And and bring everyone along for the ride, including the allied health practitioners, as Mel Absolutely. pointed out in the chat there too, and, and all the clinicians. And let, let's not, I, or may, maybe we need to go down the, the payroll tax rabbit hole. We, we steered clear of that one, but that's an, <laughs> that's one thing. I, I, but, I thought I'd bring that up because it is a practical <laughs> issue that's affecting um, practice owners. And the other thing that I reflected on again through my lens was that when I embraced RACGP accreditation, this was voluntary. Okay. So I'd been practicing in this mid, um, you know, as a gynecologist, nobody had asked any questions. I obviously we embraced the standards because we wanted to identify any gaps and to do better. But I felt wouldn't have been good if there were some uniform standards for everybody accessing Medicare as opposed to, you know, um, when we chose to emb embrace that journey. So that was another thing that I felt that, look, maybe the GP morale really needs to be recognized and to try and bring things that are more level. And I appreciate that this is just a single um, example, but that was my reflection. Yeah. And hey, look, I can see in the chat to Christina, who was in another great panel yesterday that people should go and check out, um, who's, who's representing over at Western Sydney LHD. Um, and, and actually to, to Steve, you know, the, the, the question uh, here, all the points been raised about, um, you know, having the ability to identify um, patients within, you know, a particular country through identifiers is super important. What it did bring to mind, though, for me is that, you know, here, Steve, I'm going to throw you another another meaty one, which is this whole point in Australia is that our healthcare in a state and a federal level is is can be quite separate in terms of decision making. We've got the GP yeah. and the hospital side. So if we're going to talk about multidisciplinary we've 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 got to touch on this point around the, the state and federal divide right yes look and uh, we we need us we need structurally to drive those two systems together you know we need a reason for them to meet in a meet in, in, a, in a room to actually understand each other's needs and i guess we've taken a we've put a toe in the water with this budget already um the minister's announced and you know a lot of the the, the um Press has been about the tripling of the bulk billing incentive. That's a huge, that's a huge investment uh, for you know le nearly eleven, nearly twelve million people in Australia, for people with cards and uh, those under sixteen. But the voluntary patient registration uh, announcement was also made, and for people with chronic and the first investment uh, in in uh, for those with uh, voluntary who are registered to a practice to more deeply identify which practice that they go to. Well, there's two things. One is that uh, you can get longer telehealth consultation. So if you're a consumer and you're linked to a practice, um, you're not restricted to a short consultation. You can have a long consultation with your GP. We hope we start moving into video. I chaired the the um, uh, the, the uh, telehealth uh, cup subcommittee, the MBS task force. And yes, you can do some really good work if you know the patient with the telephone, but you can do a lot more if you've got a video. And it's very simple to create that. We've, we've got solutions, so let's get on with it. So that's very good for the public. But the second thing, which is really, really important, it goes to answering your just your last question, is that we want to focus on those frequent flyers that are, that uh, turn up in emergency departments, those with chronic and complex disease. People have been to an ED more than ten times. 
We want to, and there's, there's $90 million on the table, to actually get those people, connect them with their GP that they're registered to and get that practice uh, with a block or a blended payment to actually help uh, maximise the health of that person to keep them out of emergency. So there's a, there's a, there's a reason now already today for state governments and uh, primary care to get together in a room and say, well, who are these people? Who is their GP? How are we going to keep them out of hospital? How are we going to work together? Um, there's a really, really good uh, product in New South Wales, and I know there's some listeners uh, from New South Wales, where you can connect up the information in, in primary care with acute care, and it's called Lumos. Now, it's not real time, so we've got some challenges. But when you look over your shoulder and you say, where should I invest? Lumos will tell you. And it's very clear that if you have a, a practice that sees their patients uh, and more comprehensively looks after them, they don't turn up in emergency. We also know from Lumos that if you have an unplanned admission and, uh, and when you're discharged from hospital, if you actually see your GP uh, or your GP practice within the, next, within the next three or four days, there's a significant decrease in your readmission rate. There are two areas, therefore, um, that can structurally drive the acute sector and the primary care sector together for mutual benefit. This is the sort of thing we need to see more of. Um, significant investment, that will drive those two sectors together. So the patient that thinks it's one health system, because currently they think it's at least three, maybe mm. four. And um, we need to connect up uh, community care, aged care, specialist care, acute care and primary care. It needs to be seamless. And the only way it's going to happen um, is uh, with a digital support. Um, it's not going to be digital health in, I'm hoping, five years. It's just going to be health underpinned by digital. Um, so we've, we've got some great challenges coming and we want our systems, look, we've got to redesign the My Health Record. The minister uh, said that. Um, we need your help, those listening who are, who are the IT uh, people. We need to get together with the Connected Care Council, um, you know, which is all of the key players to, to say, what are we going to do? How does it look? What is the modern way of doing this? What's the role of My Health Record going forward? What about the app? You haven't got the app, download the app, by the way. Um, search My Health Gov, get that out, yep. um, and help us make that better for you and for your, for, your, for your customers, your patients. And let's think about what it means to make information available. We need to have a copy of it in My Health Record. Well, sometimes you do. Um, but, you know, what else, how else can we, uh, can we move into the 21st century mm -hmm. properly? And what does the future look like? Please help us get there and make sure we're all on that all on that train together. I mean, and that app could be. Oh, yeah, please keep going. Yeah, I was just saying that app could be really good. Like even just yesterday, I'm just citing my own day to day examples. Is like you know when you see a pregnant woman with a white card and the vomit from the other child on it and the coffee stains from you know on it. I was just thinking like surely, surely there has to be a better way to communicate between the patient, the hospital, and the, if they're seeing in the private or in a clinic elsewhere or in a GP practice. And hopefully that app, Steve, I'm hoping that that would be the conduit for that. Mm. And I think I think you made the point many times that we need to design the health system around the patient and their carer. Exactly. Um, exactly. You kind of forget sometimes uh, that, uh, you know, it's activation of the patient and their carer uh, that are significant, uh, very significant in, in, in the health journey and, uh, you know, becoming better educated, uh, supporting uh, information available for people. Uh, we've got health tests, uh, path tests online to help people inter interpret their pathology. Absolutely, Steve. Results. They're asking yeah. us better questions. That, you know, and they are. Important. And, and, and that has been my anecdotal observation that when I started, I actually had people ahead of me in the journey say to me, oh, no, no, don't bother with that. They're not going to, you, you just, you know, and I thought, no, my experience has been very different. People, our patients want to know, they want to share, they want to be part, an active part of their healthcare in general. And it's up to us to create platforms to be able to empower them to be able to do that. Mm. Look, team, we're we're hitting it on a high and, and I can see the chat's resonating with it too. I feel like we're going to need a part two or a part three or a series to this conversation though, because, you know, as Dwayne's pointed out, we start, if we talk about personally controlled information, there's different ways that we can do this. How do we put in the, the information in the patient's hand? We're just getting started. As Steve said, we're dipping the toe, but I've heard this podcast that says collaboration starts with a conversation. So that's uh, where we're starting with it now. 
And uh, I appreciate Steve Talat coming into this conversation to to get the ball rolling and looking forward to to getting that part two going at some point. So thank you both. Thank you so much for having us. For more content and community about technology and healthcare, visit talkinghealthtech.com.